The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 13, 1 to 9. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate has mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did, or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, indeed just as we are, we've come, that you will speak to us and that you will cleanse us. Bless your words into our hearts and may we be doers of your words. In Christ's name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, a powerful back-to-back tornado plowed through Lee County in Alabama and killed at least 23, injured several, and left a path of devastation, destruction. The damage was described as very catastrophic. According to the news report, this back-to-back tornado marked the, the deadliest tornado the deadliest day for tornado in Alabama since 2011. Two weeks ago, we had the devastating news of the crash of an Ethiopian Airlines jetliner Boeing 737 MAX 8 that killed 157 people. The plane crashed six minutes after takeoff from Addis Ababa Ethiopia's capital, heading for Nairobi in clear weather. People from 35 countries, including the United States, were on board that plane. As Ethiopia observed a day of mourning, Red Cross workers slowly picked through the widely uh, scattered debris, looking for the remains of the dead, not survivors. Fear and shock gripped the whole nation when the news broke uh, in Addis Ababa and members of the Association of Ethiopian Airline Pilots cried uncontrollably for the, the uh, dead colleagues. Last year, a similar jet crash in the Indo- Indonesian sea, killing all 189 people on board. A letter was sent to all clergy from the conference office a couple of weeks ago, informing us that one of our clergy members in the Danville district and a student at um, Duke's Divinity School in North Carolina was shot and fighting for his life. We woke up last week to the news that 49 people were murdered in a terrorist attack on worshippers at a mosque in New Zealand. The question everyone is asking in the midst of all this is why? 
Why should these things be happening? Why should innocent children, fathers, mothers, and people going about their normal daily lives face such tragedies? When we face unexpected accidents or tragic events or unexpected diagnosis or illness, the question why instinctively forms on our lips. It is not just enough to say, well, it was a tornado, it was an accident, or another diagnosis. We ask, why? The world is full of evil and tragic events. Open the newspapers, turn on the television, listen to the radio, pull up your favorite homepage news, and it will probably bear some bad news for you. As if there are no tragic tragedies in our own lives, the worries of the world stream into our living rooms every day. 30,000 children die every day of hunger. Millions around the world don't have access to clean drinking water. A couple of years ago, Haiti and Chile experienced deadliest earthquake. We would never know for sure, but it's estimated that 300,000 people died in Haiti and about this, that same number were injured. The truth is, we will be insensitive in the face of these tragedies if we don't ask the dreaded question, why? It just don't, doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair. Why should God allow such things to happen? What has anyone done to deserve such tragedy? Maybe these are our current questions. You may be asking, why? Why this diagnosis? Why am I in pain every day? Why am I suffering? Why is my loved one suffering? What is going on? Why me? Have you asked why me before? I think we all have. Why me? Jesus faced the same kind of question in his time. Apparently, Pilate had some people from Galilee killed as they were worshiping. Just as they were offering sacrifice, they were killed and their own blood spilled on the altar. The question came, why? Around that same time, the Tower of Siloam collapsed, killing 18 people. Again, the question is, why? Those who had gathered around Jesus asked about the Galileans who had been killed by Pilate. Jesus himself was from the region of Galilee, so these were his hometown people asking the question. Historically speaking, we do not know anything about the murder in Galilee other than what the Gospel reading says. But we do know that Pilate was a ruler who is not kind to the Jewish people. So the Galileans want answers. Why Jesus? Why did these murders happen? Did they commit any hidden sin before they came out to worship and offer sacrifices? The belief at the time was that any misfortune that strikes must somehow be tied to sin. That is how people explain the world in those days. So they asked Jesus, were they deserving of the tragedy they experienced? Was God singling them out for punishment? Jesus gave a brief and clear answer. No, God did not pick on them for destruction. Jesus then asked, 
Do you think be that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Or the 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Ceylon fell on them? Do you think they were worse sinners than anyone else walking by the tower that day? God does not punish us by throwing tragedy upon us. God doesn't play it like that. There are real injustice in this world. I'm sure you'll agree with me that sometimes the undeserving gain and the deserving lose. The innocent suffers. The guilty often never account for their action. The world is not fair. And we don't always get the answers we want. While Jesus denied that the people Pilate killed and those who were crushed by the Tower of Ceylon were being punished for their evil, he went on and said, I tell you, unless you repent, you will also perish as they did. Repent, or you will perish. Repent, all of you. But what does repent actually mean? To repent is to turn around. You know, in the early church, maybe you know of this, in the early church, before adults were baptized, they would literally turn their bodies as they made their baptismal vows. They will renounce Satan and all the ways of evil turning um, westwards. Which, which side is west? <laughs> okay. So they would turn westwards. Okay. <laughs> Towards um, the direction of despair and, and darkness. And then turn eastward, this way, right? Eastwards, towards sunrise, to confess their faith in Jesus Christ, a sign of new beginning. So this way, to confess their sin during the, um, when they are denouncing the powers of evil. Like we're doing away with our old life and turn this way towards the sunrise as a sign of new beginning. But here in the Gospel of Luke, repent means not only to turn around, but also to look at the world with a changed mind and heart. So we don't only turn around, but we look at the world with a changed mind and heart. It is turning away from our sinful ways and turning to God. As I said on Ash Wednesday, it repent is more than feeling sorry or regret for sin or wrongdoing. It involves turning a new direction. You turn in a new direction. It is a step beyond wanting to be different or trying to be different. It is becoming different. It is becoming a person of integrity. Jesus says, unless you repent, you will also perish, as they did. Then he tells this parable of a man who owned a vineyard. In that vineyard was a fig tree, a fig tree that had no fruit on it when it's expected to be bearing fruit. Cut it down, the owner said to the gardener, for three years, I have been looking for fruit on this tree and found none. Cut it down. Why should it be using the soil? In the first place, the fig tree is not asked to produce bananas. The owner of the vineyard did, did not ask anything extraordinary out of the fig tree than to bear fig fruit. He isn't asking the fig tree to become an oak or a redwood. He asks only that it accomplish what fig trees ought to accomplish to bear fruit. 
in season. We are no different. We all have God-given gifts, and we are expected to be effective and bear fruit. And all of us have some natural abilities and capabilities. The point is that God does not ask us to become what we are not. We are asked only to accomplish what our God-given gifts allow. I read a story about a man who was walking through the countryside one morning when he noticed a young man standing at attention in a field. In the afternoon after the man came back along that same path and noticed that the young man was still there, standing there. Curious, he approached and asked what the young man was doing. I am practicing for the Nobel Prize. The, man, the young man replied, how is that? Asked the man. Well, said the young man, one of the criteria is to be outstanding in your chosen field. I am practicing to be outstanding. <laughs> Fortunately for us, God is not asking us to be outstanding. He is not asking that we produce more fruit than anyone else, but he does expect us to produce the fruit that we are able to. Each of us is able to bear fruit. Each of us is, each of us is given a gift. God has given all of us gifts and abilities to produce fruit. We are called to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ in this world. But before we can become effective disciples and bear fruit, we must be willing to turn around and turn towards God and what God requires of us. We should be willing to love our neighbors and we should be willing to love our enemies. To forgive those who have hurt us. To bring hope to those who despair. To encourage those who, fall, who are faltering. To share the good news of Jesus Christ with those who are looking for a new life. To sacrifice our possessions and our time for those who are in greater need than us. These are some of the fruits we are required to be bearing. The gardener said to the owner of the vineyard, give it a chance. I, will, I rate the soil, put some fertilizer on it, and see if it bears fruit next year. God is so good. God is the God of a second chance. He does not desire any to perish. Scripture says in Ezekiel 18, 32, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. God has given us the opportunity now to repent and do right. Time is not on our side to keep off right relationship with God. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. All we have is today. We are still in Lent. So I encourage you as we go through the season of Lent to examine your life, examine yourself. See where you're falling short. See where you are lacking. Repent of all that will hinder the grace of God from reaching down to you. And may you bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.